get the. Hi everyone, and welcome to week three of Crim 210, which is going to be focusing on early theories of crime, including biological explanations of crime and social explanations of crime. But before we look at any of this, I want to just make a quick callback to the week two lecture. I wanted to talk about extended adolescence and how 25 or 23 is the new age 18. So remember how we talked about conceptualizations of adolescence. And when I say conceptualization, it's just a fancy word for a definition of adolescence. And we've seen over the years how we've gone from not really defining adolescence at all as a unique biological age stage to looking at maybe ages 12 to 17 as the definition of adolescence to more recently looking at adolescence even beyond age 17, 18, 19. In California, and some awesome work by Zachary Rowan, who's a faculty member here in the School of Criminology, has looked at an emerging adulthood court. So we have a youth justice system and an adult justice system, but what they're saying is, well, maybe we should also have this in-between youth and adult court, which could be like an emerging adulthood court where individuals will be processed under this less severe, not as severe as adult system, because of the recognition that these are individuals who are still developing and thus maybe are more amenable to rehabilitation. So this article, I believe originally from the New York Times showed that compared to 15 years ago, adolescents at age 18 are less likely to drive, less likely to have a part-time job, less likely to date, less likely to be going out with friends in the evening. So essentially what we're seeing is like, a, if you've ever seen the movie Benjamin Button, we're seeing like a Benjamin Button-like situation where in the past people were treated as older than they actually were. Kids being sent out to farms, sent out to be acting as like the mentee to a mentor or somebody in the trades. And now individuals are treating, being treated younger than they actually are. So why is this happening? The authors of this article found that adolescents were more likely to take part in adult activities if they came from larger families or those with lower incomes. So these individuals, due to their financial situation, were required to take on more adult-like roles. This mirrors what's called like life history theory, which basically says that exposure to unpredictable or impoverished environments can lead kids to develop faster than the average kid who grew up maybe in a more stable environment or with more resources available to them. So kids who are living more prosperously, and we've seen improvements in the prosperity of people living in North America over time, are less likely to have to sort of match the evolutionary stage of adolescence where they're required to go out and engage in adult roles. And these adult roles don't just mean good things, it also means abstaining from some more negative behaviors like drinking, going out with friends, being out past curfew, and so on we still see some very sizable income disparities, especially in the United States, but the average income in US families has grown. People are more likely to live longer. And as a result, people are doing things like they're waiting longer to get married, they're waiting longer to have children. Just think about your own lives and how it takes a lot longer for you to enter your career goals. Almost all persons now do some form of post-secondary education or trade school education. And so it takes time to enter jobs, which can take time, which can delay entering into marital relationships, delay having kids. So I thought this was important to bring up just because we had talked about it a little bit in the past week's lecture. For this week, we'll be focusing on theory. And I have to admit, I just pulled some of the material that I've talked about before in CRIM 103 to touch on some of the key theoretical themes of this course because it's essentially the same information and I'm just too lazy to do these videos all over again if I have the videos sitting next to me already. So that's what I'm gonna do for, for some of the lectures is just pull in material from other courses. But we'll also begin with what I think is important and just acknowledging what theory actually means. When we're looking at criminological theories, they can be identified based on different principles of a theory. So what are the key features of a theory? One is parsimony, which is just a fancy word for being simplistic. The most simple explanation of crime tends to be preferred. 
the theory needs to identify causal mechanisms. That is, what are the risk factors that increase the likelihood of crime happening, or what are the protective factors that prevent crime from happening? Also need to consider mediators and moderators. How do mediators and moderators work? Moderators, I think, a little bit more simple to understand. It suggests that a risk factor only increases the likelihood of offending when in the presence of some other factor. Let's, for example, take a look at abuse experiences. And this is just a hypothetical example. Maybe on its own, abuse experiences do not predict offending. However, we can look at maybe factors that might moderate the relationship between abuse and offending. For example, maybe some individuals have experienced abuse from a stranger and some individuals have experienced abuse by a family member. Maybe we expect that the abuse perpetrated by a family member to have a bigger impact on the individual. If we look at abuse and look at whether it is moderated, let's say, by a negative family environment, maybe we'll find that an individual when abused and living in a negative family environment is more likely to engage in criminal behavior that someone, than someone that has experienced abuse but is living in a positive family environment. A mediator basically looks at causes of causes. For example, perhaps we think that abuse is related to offending, but maybe abuse is mediated by some other causal chain or causal factor. For example, maybe the experience of abuse leads to a detachment from family and a detachment from friends. Some have hypothesized that strong features of psychopathy emerge as a result of physical or sexual abuse experiences. So maybe the relationship between physical abuse and offending is mediated by, let's say, affective factors like callous and unemotional traits. So physical abuse might cause callous and unemotional traits, which might then cause offending. Another key element of a theory is that it has to be testable and it has to be falsifiable. So we actually have to have ways where we can go out and conduct research to test the theory and see whether it is true or not. Another key feature of the theory is whether there is actually empirical support for the theory. So if it has been tested and it has been falsified, then we should discard it. Some suggest that theory should be interdisciplinary. This could be, for example, the approach of integrating different research perspectives or different disciplines like psychology and sociology. Others say no, theory integration should never happen. Travis Hershey, who's one of our famous criminologists, has been one of the big proponents of monocausal theories. A monocausal theory selects one risk factor or a set of interrelated risk factors and examines whether it does or does not account for all variants in offending. We'll see in this lecture how disrespectful theories, theories that aren't attuned to culture, language, differences across different ethnic groups, might be a reason for why theories are not useful and actually can do harm to society. And when we take these different principles together, not all are given the same weight. Travis Hershey, for example, would say something like parsimony is the most important feature of a theory. Terence Thornberry, who's known for his integrated theories, might say things like we have to make sure we pay attention to mediators, moderators, and be interdisciplinary. But what these theories share in common is they tend to have an interrelated set of hypotheses designed to explain some phenomenon or some outcome of interest. So our independent variables are what we're trying to use to explain our dependent variable. In criminology, a independent variable might be low self-control and our dependent variable might be offending. So our theory of low self-control, which is known as the general theory of crime, suggests that a very simple hypothesis, which is that low self-control causes all crime all the time. That's something that we'll probably talk about next week. For now, I'll be focusing more on the building blocks of criminology, focusing on earlier criminological theories. You'll recall last week where I talked about Cesare Beccaria, and he was well known for being part of the classical school. 
which is essentially a way of thinking that emerged right after the church's stranglehold over explanations of offending. So instead of believing in things like demonic possession, individuals were believed to have free will. They were rational, intelligent beings that could choose whether to engage in criminal behavior or not. So this paradigm was really focused on understanding the criminal law process and how individuals think. The idea that if we have a fair justice system with codified laws and a philosophy of punishment, people will recognize that there is this fair system. If I do engage in this criminal behavior, I will get caught, I will be punished, and the punishment will outweigh any reward I might have for involvement in that particular behavior. Jeremy Bentham was also very instrumental in bringing in ideas of the proportionality of punishment and case precedent, aka common law. It's the idea that if an individual's punishment is fair, they're more likely to not continue in that particular behavior. Shortly after the classical school, before we get to the positive school that I'll talk about next, was what we call the neoclassical school, which I think made a really important recognition that helped bridge the classical school and the positivist school. The key concept that came from the neoclassical school was this notion of bounded rationality. Beccaria tended to believe that all individuals have free will and all individuals are equal in their ability to exercise rational thought. We know that this is not true. We know that the five-year-old is less adept at exercising rational thought than the 25-year-old. The kid with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder will be less able to exercise free will than somebody of the same age but who doesn't suffer from this neurological deficit. The neoclassical school therefore brought in this idea of bounded rationality, that an individual's ability to look at the pros and the cons of certain behavior is constrained by both their environment and themselves. So their environment might be whether they have to react quickly or whether they've been drinking or whether they're under threat from others. At the individual level, we'd be looking at things like low self-control, features of psychopathy that might influence an individual to not really think about the consequences or not care about the consequences of their behavior when they actually go to perpetrate said behavior. Following the neoclassical school came the positivist school of thought around the 19th century. And the key principles of the positivist school of thought was that only that which is observable through the scientific method is knowable. If you read sociological textbooks or like a Crim 104 textbook, they can paint a very negative picture of positivist school principles. And I think this is an unfair characterization. Under the positivist school, unfortunately, there were a lot of ideological individuals who did not follow the scientific method. So what I would argue is that the positivist school itself is not problematic. It's the individuals within the positivist school that were problematic. For me, to do positivist criminology is just to actually just do pure research to try and explain or understand a phenomenon. But for individuals like Cesare Lombroso and Henrik Goddard, they were very much focused on things like, for Goddard, the eugenics movement, for Lombroso identifying feeble-minded individuals or individuals who are associated with atavism and labeling these individuals as psychopaths or born criminals. So they weren't really good at doing the scientific method. A lot of ideological thinking drove their thought process and drove the conclusions that they made. But the positivist school itself was very important for emphasizing that we can use research to understand why individuals might engage in criminal behavior. Lombroso's perspective was very simply thought that criminals and non-criminals were at different stages of evolutionary development. So his concept of the atavistic man essentially was suggesting that this individual was an evolutionary throwback to a different time. And we'll talk about Lombroso in a little bit more detail later on. Same thing with Henry Goddard. We'll talk about him in our tutorial discussions and we'll take a look at his study on the Calicat family. He was very influential in the eugenics movement that permeated both the United States and Canada. I'll talk about Leilani Muir who experienced involuntary sterilization based on Canada's racist practices influenced by the eugenics movement. So there are good reasons to think negatively about 
researchers under the positivist school. But keep in mind that the positivist school is really just focusing on trying to use the scientific method to help explain particular phenomena. I've kind of explained each of these perspectives, but just so you can kind of see how the classical school and the positivist school can differ. So the classical school argues for free will. Some individuals within the positivist school have argued for determinism. So if you're born with a certain set of factors, that guarantees that you will be associated with criminal behavior. Now people have pulled away from this deterministic aspect of the positivist school. The classical school essentially reduces humans to having free will and being hedonistic, that is pleasure seeking. And so an individual will engage in any type of behavior if the benefits that they can reap from that behavior are more than the punishment that might incur. The classical school emphasizes the offense, the idea that we should respond to the criminal behavior proportionally, that we need specific laws for specific types of behavior so that we have that proportionate sentencing philosophy, and that we need to restrict people's opportunities for specific offenses. Very much based on the idea that all humans are the same, but offending behaviors differ, so that's what we need to focus on. The positive school emphasizes the focus on the individual and the different causal mechanisms that might lead them to engage in criminal behavior. Because the classical school is so much concerned with proportionality, with codified laws, with case laws, they tend to focus on the punishment side of things. Individuals don't need to change, it's that we need to make these laws stricter to decrease the likelihood that they might perpetrate a crime in the future. The positive school says, no, we actually need to be more rehabilitative. It's not that this individual wasn't deterred and that all we need to do is make the criminal behavior or the punishment for that criminal behavior more severe. We need to help identify which causal mechanisms within this particular individual are influencing this person's involvement in criminal behavior. How do we treat that risk factor so that this person will no longer engage in crime. Now we'll jump into some discussion about some early biological theories of crime that I've talked about also in CRIM 103. dive into talking a little bit about the background of biological theories of crime, I want to just be clear about some of the myths of biological theory. So sometimes even contemporary biological theories of crime have been portrayed as deterministic. The idea that these biological crime theories are like pretending to be minority report and that we can definitely predict crime with 100% accuracy in the future. This is not what any modern contemporary biological theory of crime actually says, at least ones that pass it through peer review and make it into key journal articles, books, and so on. So in contemporary criminology, biological theories do not say that there's any such thing as a crime gene. It's the intersection of genes and environment that are important. So if we're talking about early biological perspectives on crime, we probably want to start with Franz Gopp, who was an uh, Austrian researcher that developed the idea of phrenology. So this is the idea that the shape of the skull, so not the actual brain, but the shape of the skull can be used to predict criminality. So ultimately this perspective was just complete BS. There was no actual evidence that the shape of the skull was informative of whether somebody would be or would not be involved in crime. But 
was important about this perspective was that it marked a movement away from religious explanations of crime. Up until this point, people who engaged in crime were basically said to be possessed by demons. Like, literally, I'm not making this up. That was their perspective. And so Franz Gall kind of went towards a more empirical explanation of crime. He believed that we can actually identify in individuals not some supernatural explanation of crime, but some physical attribute among individuals that might help explain their involvement in criminal behavior. Now this individual was completely wrong, but at least it set in motion a path towards this understanding of crime. Another researcher that was very interested in biological explanations of crime was Cesare Lombroso. Lombroso earned the name basically like the father of criminology because he provided some really ultimately inaccurate ideas but some really important ideas about looking at the details of an individual that might explain their involvement in criminal behavior. One of the things that he focused on was just like Gall was on phrenology but he also focused on a number of different things within the fender population. So he went into prison and began to try and look at what he thought was unique amongst these individuals. Rosso had a whole swath of relatively odd ideas about what might or might not explain criminal behavior. Left-handedness was one. For, for quite a period of time, people viewed individuals that were left-handed as tricksters or criminals or deviants. So apologies to anybody in the class who's left-handed. But where this came from, or at least where I've heard this came from, is when two knights were walking down a road and they were coming to a head, or I guess it could be any two people, the custom was to use your right hand to lift up your face shield on your helmet to show that you know you were a friend, and by using your right hand to lift up this visor, you couldn't actually then use your right hand to draw your sword. So it was a way to show that you were friendly, but also a way to make sure that you couldn't actually reach your weapon. So both people were expected to do this and that they could sort of go their separate ways. But if somebody was left-handed, they could follow this norm, but still have their left hand free to attack. So that's uh, obviously non-midterm little tidbit for you, but just to explain where this perception of left-handedness and deviancy comes from. Another perspective Lombroso had was that people with sloped foreheads, attached ear lobes, sort of hooked noses, these individuals would be involved in criminal behavior as well. And this goes back to his perspective of a term that he coined called the atavistic man. Atavism essentially means an evolutionary throwback. Such individuals have not actually fully evolved. That's why they have like ape-like features or Lombroso also believes that the hooked nose was a sign that this individual evolved from birds. Like, so there were some wild perspectives that Lombroso had. And he was ultimately wrong about virtually everything, but pioneering in the sense that now we began to look at individual level characteristics of offenders. When it came to women, Lombroso had extremely sexist attitudes towards their involvement in crime. He also had very racist attitudes as well. And so contemporary criminology really does not look back at Lombroso's perspectives with a lot of merit, but of women, he suggested that the only women that engaged in crime were women from Sicily. So obviously Lombroso, by the name, uh, is from Italy, and he suggested that only women from Sicily engaged in criminal behavior, and specifically women who were shorter with brown hair. Taylor Swift is basically a modern day Lombroso. Taylor Swift sort of writes songs about ex-lovers that she perceived to have scorned her, Lombroso basically, instead of writing a song, he wrote an entire theory about a woman who probably wanted nothing to do with him because he was racist and sexist. But that's sort of where we begin to see criminology transition from this perspective of vending as a innate cause because of demonic possession to looking at specific characteristics of the individual. Okay, so one more Lombroso perspective, because this one is especially unique or odd, but again, sort of paints a picture of biological perspectives from the 1800s. Story of Cain and Abel. And basically, God asked Cain and Abel to sacrifice, I believe it was a goat, um, as a way to show their, their faith in God. Abel 
sacrifice a goat and Cain didn't want to sacrifice his goat so he sacrificed crops instead. God favored Abel and did not favor Cain and so Cain grew jealous and he and he killed Cain killed Abel and then in response God was said to have marked Cain and there's great debate about what this mark actually looks like but as you can see from this red symbol there's this little crease this red line that's running through the, the screen there. So, according to Lobroso, I want you to cup your hand, just like this, and look at the middle of your hand. And if you see two creases, two big, like, kind of wrinkles in the middle of your hand, according to Lombroso, this was normal and a sign that you were not an offender. But if you have one crease lining the middle of your palm, that means that you definitely are an offender or definitely going to be an offender. So if you're in the latter case, again, don't worry. Lombroso has some pretty crazy ideas. He said that people with tattoos were guaranteed to be involved in crime. He said that people with webbed toes were guaranteed to be involved in crime. And also talked about, and don't try this one in public, but stick your tongue out. And if there's like a line or a fissure running through your tongue, that also meant that you're guaranteed to be involved in crime. So we've come a long way since Lombroso's perspective. Older biological perspective that we'll focus on in this lecture is Sheldon's somatotypes. Sheldon's somatotypes does kind of carry a little bit of weight. In terms of the utility of this perspective in understanding uh, people who might be more likely to be involved in crime. On the one hand, we have ectomorphs. These individuals are skinny, withdrawn, they're believed to be like sort of apprehensive, high anxiety, think like a real like Woody Allen type. Endomorphs are believed to be more obtuse and outgoing, kind of like a jolly Santa Claus. And the mesomorphs are believed to be like muscular, aggressive, kind of angry and assertive. And Sean suggested that only mesomorphs would be involved in criminal behavior. So on the one hand, we can see some evidence of this when we look in, say for example, a custody center, we might find individuals more likely to meet this description of a mesomorph. The question becomes, what, it's kind of like a chicken versus the egg, what came first? Maybe individuals who are mesomorphic are so because they became involved in crime and they realized that being, having physical attributes would be helpful in order to be able to commit crime. So we don't really know what would necessarily come first. In fact, with some individuals involved in crime, they are engaged in also drug use, using crystal meth that can really severely change their body shape. So Sheldon's somatotypes, I would say, is also inaccurate, but we can begin to look at how physical, key, physical features might be associated with involvement in criminal behavior. Fortunately, the government has a long history of oppressing black, indigenous, and other persons of culture. But especially in the early 1900s, indigenous persons were really strongly discriminated against. And we saw forced sterilization by the Canadian government against indigenous persons. And one of the more well-known cases was a, a young woman named Lani Muir. And she was mostly just a more introverted young girl, and she was given an IQ test, received a low score, and rather than, without even telling the person that she was being sterilized, the government said, we're just going to remove your appendix. And then while they were doing that, they actually removed her ability to have children and didn't tell her about this. It wasn't until 10 years later that she actually found out about this. So. You can begin to understand why biological perspectives of crime have really been avoided for a long period of time by criminologists. There's a really horrific history of the government misusing research to justify really bringing harm to other people, but also the research itself just being really poor, really ideological, and really racist. When we look at family studies, we can't say that there is a genetic effect of Criminality, criminality within the family might be due to that family's environmental experience. This family might be exposed to poverty or a high crime neighborhood, and these are the factors that are driving involvement in criminal behavior amongst this family, and not some underlying genetic reason. What we can say for sure, though, is that with family studies, 
criminality can be found to be more common in some families than others. And criminality by the mother tends to have a stronger influence on the criminal behavior of the children than criminality by the father. So this is one of the topics that we can talk about for the, the tutorial discussions this week. Think about why the mother might have a more impactful influence on her child's criminal behavior compared to a father that might also be involved in crime. Just to summarize what we've talked about regarding family studies so far. So there's two main findings. Criminality tends to be more common in some families than others, and especially criminality in the background of the mother has a more strong influence on the perpetration of criminal behavior for the offspring than the criminality of the father. And maybe we'll see this finding change over time as we begin to see more equivalent gender roles. But traditionally, mothers were responsible for raising children. So their criminal behavior might have more of an impact on the criminal behavior of the child. Somewhat ironically, this would suggest more of an environmental influence, even though family studies originally, such as that one by Goddard, was more focused on trying to say that there was a genetic relationship between family and crime. Very, very importantly, this will probably show up on the final exam, or at least it'll show up in other classes as well. It's important to understand that the family chain of criminality cannot be linked to genetics. Why is this the case? It's because our research designs aren't capable of looking at whether the mother's influence on the child was related to the passing down of certain genes or whether it was the environment that the individual was brought up in. Basically, these family studies, by looking only at the family, are not able to dictate whether the individual shared the same genes as the parent, and that's why they engaged in crime or the individual shared the same environment as their parent, and that's why they engaged in crime. So let's talk about- All the right, let's get started. What are you doing? The same half? That's my- Well, let's talk about twin studies. All right, yeah, well, well, let's do that. So doing twin study research entails recruiting pairs of twins and distinguishing them according to whether they represent monozygotic twins or dizygotic twins. And monozygotic twins are identical, they share 100% of the same DNA. And dizygotic twins are fraternal twins, so they're no more genetically similar than two siblings of different age. And twin studies are different from family studies because the thing about both monozygotic and dizygotic twins is they share the same environment. For siblings of different ages, we can't be as sure whether they share the same environment or, or not. This means that we cannot determine whether similarities in behavior between non-twin siblings is due to genetic similarity or to environmental similarity. For twin studies, it's hypothesized that both identical and fraternal twins share 100% of the same environment. So if we find that monozygotic twins are more similar to each other than dizygotic twins are to each other, this similarity has to be due to the identical DNA of monozygotic twins. So to understand twin studies, we need to nail down a basic term, concordance, which is when both twins experience the same outcome, like crime, or when twins do not experience that outcome, like not committing a crime. So in twin studies of crime, we expect concordance to be higher among monozygotic twins than dizygotic. We'll do an example. Okay, so let's take a look at how twin studies work. So essentially we're looking at the concordance between two, two variables twin variable, where it'll be a monozygotic pair or a dizygotic pair, and whether both twins have or have not committed an act of violence. So you can see the top here we have, has twin B ever committed an act of violence? No or yes. Has twin A ever committed an act of violence? No and yes. So concordance is where the stars are. So both twin A and twin B have not engaged in violence, or twin A and twin B have engaged in an act of violence. So this is what an actual study would look like. So at the top, we have monozygotic twins, and we have 100 pairs. The bottom, we have dizygotic twins, and we also have 100 pairs. So it's the exact same slide that we just saw earlier, but now we have the actual percentages and sample size here. So when we look at monozygotic twins, 
we can see that for twin B, 75 individuals out of the 100 said that they had not engaged in an act of violence. And when we look at twin A, we also see that 70 plus 5 individuals indicated that they had not engaged in an act of violence. So what we see in terms of concordance is that 70 out of the 75 twins that were part B said that they had never committed violence. There was a twin A that also said that they had never committed violence. So this is a concordance rate of 93.3% or 70 out of 75. If we look at dizygotic twins down below, we can see the concordance between twin B and twin A in terms of no and no is 50 out of 75. That 50 plus 25, so 50 out of 75, indicating a concordance rate of 66.7%. When we look at the concordance of having actually engaged in violence, so for monozygotic twins, we see yes and yes for 20, out of the 20 plus 5 is 25, 20 out of 25 twin pairs. So that's a concordance rate of 80% compared to just 60% for the comparison of dizygotic twins. So here we can break down these numbers in terms of the total concordance that was observed. So really what we're doing is we're just adding the concordance of the yeses and the concordance of the noes. So we can see that the concordance here if the subject is a monozygotic twin, yes, yes, the concordance was 90%. If the subject is not a monozygotic twin, aka they're a dizygotic twin, the concordance was only 65%. So here we're seeing that the concordance rate is much higher amongst monozygotic twins compared to dizygotic twins. Some will say that identical twins are likely to share a similar environment compared to fraternal twins. And this would be a limitation of twin studies. Opponents of twin studies say that the reason why identical twins' environments are more similar is because they are genetically more similar. So they influence a more similar environment. It's mind melding. So twin studies that have actually looked at the concordance between monozygotic twins and criminal behavior and dizygotic twins and criminal behavior tends to suggest that approximately 50% of the variation in antisocial behavior can be explained entirely by genetics. So this is both impressive and also a good reminder that the environment also matters. It also tells us that there is no such thing as a specific crime gene or that we have this silver bullet of, you know, if one twin is involved in crime, we know that the other one is going to be involved in crime as well. But when it comes to studies of, for example, schizophrenia or ADHD, we see that there is quite a high correlation between twin A, that's monozygotic, having schizophrenia or ADHD, and twin B also having that disorder. So it is really important that we look at this genetic component. And there have been a few different types of studies that have looked at twin research in more detail to begin to understand the relationship between genetics and antisocial behavior. So one study is the Twins Early Development Study, and what this study found was that there was a high heritability of callous and un unemotional, straight, unemotional traits. So C of traits that we talked about last week with Paul Frick. When it comes to antisocial behavior, however, they didn't really find a particularly strong heritable link between antisocial behavior, but what they did find is that when individuals were maltreated and had this genetic propensity, then that was what would be particularly likely to result in antisocial behavior. The uh, Swedish twin study found that the relationship between genetics and antisocial behavior was stronger earlier in the life course. So this is important for two reasons. First, remember that the earlier the onset of behavior, the more likely that behavior is going to continue. And this is important because it also kind of it makes sense that genetics would play a larger role in life outcomes earlier in the life course than later in the life course, because earlier in the life course, the environment hasn't really had as much of an opportunity to exert an influence on the individual.
So as we talked about earlier, one of the limitations of twin studies could be that parents are more likely to provide similar environments for monozygotic twins compared to dizygotic twins. So we're not really able to control for that shared environment problem. It's more similarly shared environment for monozygotic twins. Though again, proponents of twin studies say that the reason why monozygotic twins have a more similar environment is not because their environment treats them the same way. It's because monozygotic twins basically kind of seek out the same environment because they have the same likes and interests, and this is a genetic basis. Another problem with twin studies is heritability estimates from monozygotic twins can be confounded by prenatal factors. So in utero, monozygotic twins tend to share the same placenta, so they're more likely to have this, a similar level of birth weight compared to dizygotic twins, so they can have some basically early environmental shared experiences that can influence their greater levels of similarity compared to dizygotic twins. Another problem is that, I mean it's fortunate, but when we look at the general population, rates of violence and other types of criminal behavior aren't very high. So what we can run into is the problem of type 2 error, or what we call the false negative problem. So if we look here, we can see uh, four different outcomes that are possible when we're trying to look at the association between anything really, but we'll use in this case the example of twins committing a twin that commits crime. So if twin A commits crime, we expect twin B to commit crime. If twin B does commit crime, that's what we call a true positive. We expected that outcome to occur, and it did in fact occur. A true negative is when twin A does not engage in crime, and then twin B does not engage in crime. A false positive would be where twin A engages in crime, yet twin B does not engage in crime. In crime. And finally, a false negative is when twin A does not engage in crime, but twin B does engage. So another type of study that tries to get around the shared environment problem is by looking at adoption studies. Very importantly, these adoption studies really only work if the participant in the study, so the child, was separated from their biological parent at birth. So this helps deal with the shared environment problem because it separates the person's biological experience, so what they receive from their biological parent, but they do not get to experience any of the biological parent's environmental factors. All their environmental factors come from a person who they share no genetic similarity to. So there are two types of adoption study designs. One is to look at the concordance between the adopted child and their biological parent versus the adopted child and their adopted. If the child shows more similarity with their biological parent, it's a sign of a genetic effect. If the child shows more similarity with their adopted parent, it's more of an environmental effect. The other type of study can look at children and if their sibling was not adopted. So for example, if one of their siblings was raised by the biological parents, but they were raised by the adoptive parents, then we can look at the child raised in their genetic setting versus another child raised in a new environmental setting, and we'll look at the comparison between siblings there. One of the challenges with adoption studies is that there tends to be abnormally high rates of antisocial behavior for adopted children um, because these individuals can tend to come from more negative backgrounds. They also tend to be placed in more positive backgrounds. So this is not always the case, but usually when individuals in British Columbia, for example, want to adopt, they have to show that they have you know, stable employment, a good income, and that they're good people. And they're going to be capable parents. And so there's some criteria, some thresholds that individuals have to go through. So they tend to be placed in very positive environmental experiences. Now just because they're placed in a positive environmental experience does not mean that things are going to work out well for them. So an example of this would be Kayla Bork. So she was actually an SFU student. I'll tell you a little bit of a story about her. So she was uh, from a Romanian orphanage and it was adopted by a family in British Columbia who by all accounts was very loving and supportive of this person. She did extremely well in uh, school as well as here at SFU. She was actually a criminology student and was typically getting AIDS. She was in a class looking at sexual offending and another class looking at sort of forensic evidence 
and she thought that another student uh, was someone that she could confide in and told this student that she had fantasies about going to the downtown east side and murdering homeless people. So very fortunately, the student that she confided in contacted the TA, the TA contacted the prof, contacted the campus security, and in Kayla Bork's room on residence, they found like a, a Dexter-style kill kit with zap straps and syringes. They found videos of her torturing animals. So this is an example of an individual who we don't know much about her genetic background, but it does seem to be that she was raised in a very supportive environment, yet was still going on to have an interest in engaging in very, very serious crimes. So in this slide, I'm not going to talk much about it. I'm just going to leave it here for those of you who are studying to give you a good sort of description of the strengths and limitations of the three studies we've reviewed so far, which are family studies, twin studies, and adoption studies. historical theories of crime based on biological explanations. Now we'll focus a little bit on psychological explanations of crime. We'll talk a little bit about Freud, a little bit about V.F. Skinner, Bandura, and then look at some moral development theorists like Piaget and Kohlberg. I'm sure everyone has heard of Freud's psychodynamic theory, so I'm not going to talk about it in too much detail. I also don't want to talk about Freud too much because he was a bit of a nut job. I'll begin first with just describing what his theory of, or his psychodynamic theory actually postulated. Very importantly, Freud never actually developed a theory of criminal behavior, but his psychodynamic theory has been extended to try and explain criminal behavior. There are three key elements to the psychodynamic theory. The first is the id. It's our basic hedonistic tendencies, our sort of seeking of immediate pleasure. It's our natural instinct. Then our ego is our reality-oriented thinking. So being rational, thinking about the consequences of our behavior. So ego sounds like somebody who would be, for example, narcissistic, but really the id is capturing that more narcissistic, low self-control aspect of a person's personality. The super ego is what is meant to be regulating our it. It's our conscience and our ability to restrain our behavior, to have morals. A super ego that's not functioning correctly is going to lead to criminal behavior because the super ego is responsible for essentially regulating our it. Freud argued that parenting and trauma are the primary sources of poor development. Here's why Freud's perspective is somewhat interesting. It had a big influence on how criminological theory of modern times actually worked. Freud was talking a lot about developmental stages. The idea that an individual needed to have their superego develop, needed to pass through one developmental stage so that they could begin to pass through a second developmental stage. And this influenced some contemporary criminological theories that we'll refer to as control theories. Control theories suggest that certain things have to happen so that an individual will not engage in criminal behavior. Travis Hershey's social bond theory was one of these types of control theories that said that an individual would not engage in crime if they had attachment, commitment, involvement, belief. We'll talk about all of this next week. But the idea here is that something has to happen for the individual to not engage in crime. And so Freud's psychodynamic theory did help sort of provide some building blocks towards more contemporary criminological theory. The problem with Freud was that he was actually not so much interested in really developing and refining his psychodynamic theory. Not often talked about, but what Freud was most focused on was the use of cocaine for the purposes of an anesthetic. He wanted to look at how cocaine could be used in dentistry as an anesthetic. So if someone was removing a tooth, we could give that person cocaine and then they would not feel as much pain. And Freud liked to test out his product a little bit and he became addicted to cocaine. A large part of his research and his writing was based on trying to develop ways to use cocaine as an anesthetic. And so he developed some pretty wild ideas on the side. 
for example, he developed these ideas about like the oral, the anal fixation stages. He developed ideas about the Oedipal complex. And these were the antithesis to positivist theories of crime because Freud never bothered to try and test whether these theories were accurate. He did not look at whether these different theoretical perspectives or these different pathways were actually observable. He did not test them. He did not collect data to see if kids went through these different phases. So I'm not going to talk about them really at all because I don't even want you to bother memorizing them because they're not actually useful to understanding personality development or criminal behavior. Behaviorism is the psychology of action and it was developed by John Watson who really wanted to make psychology a hard science. He suggested that we need to move away from Freudian ideas of looking at how people might internalize things or their thinking processes. He said we can't learn anything from examining mental processes. We should only study that which we can directly observe. So just like any of the hard sciences, we should only be looking at things that we can directly measure. So one of the ideas that Watson has had was that humans don't have free will. Thoughts are not actually mental processes. They're physical ones and we need to measure these physical things. One of the experiments that Watson did to sort of demonstrate learning was an experiment on a child named Little Albert. So what Watson did was expose Little Albert to, I can't remember if it was a mouse or a rat, some sort of white, fluffy, fuzzy. And when this individual would be exposed to, let's just say, the mouse, a huge clang would happen to scare the child. They take the mouse away and bring it back, clang, make this big noise, and eventually they were basically trying to pair seeing a mouse with fear. So they're pairing this clang, this big loud noise that scares the child with the mouse, and then they associate the mouse with this fearful response. This is to say that it wasn't the mouse that it scared them initially, it was the big loud noise, but now they associate this mouse with this loud noise. What happened according to reports of this study is that little Albert then became fearful not just of mice but anything that was white and fluffy, whether it's Santa Claus, stuffed animals, anything like that. And so this was viewed to be an extremely unethical experiment because, and again we don't really refer to it as an experiment because there was no treatment control group, but the idea that they did not do anything to get rid of this conditioned response. They allowed little Albert to continue to associate these white fluffy things with a, a fearful response, so they would get upset constantly. I'll post to Canvas some links of some documentaries that you can watch about little Albert. There have been a lot of studies trying to follow up and find little Albert to see what happened to him later on in life. Some people have suggested that he actually died at a very young age because he was actually born with some sort of neurological disorder to begin with and that might actually have also been related to why he was uh, fearful of different things. Everyone's heard the classic description of Pavlov and the dog and the bell and producing a conditioned response. So let's take a look at one, how this happens and what these key terms refer to. At its core, a neutral stimulus, when paired with an unconditioned stimulus, is able to produce a conditioned response, even when the unconditional stimulus is removed. The neutral stimulus then becomes a conditioned stimulus. So let's go back and look at some of these key terms. The neutral stimulus is something like a bell. When it rings, we wouldn't normally salivate. We wouldn't really have any response. That's why it's called neutral. An unconditioned stimulus is something in the environment that produces a natural response. So for example, salivation. We would not necessarily think or try to salivate when we see meat. We would just, for something we really want to eat, we would just naturally respond, respond by salivating. However, if we pair the bell, which is the neutral stimulus, the meat, which is the unconditional stimulus, we can begin to create a conditioned response. So that natural salivation, that's considered an unconditional response. There's no reason for it other than it's sort of innate. The conditioned response is when we then begin to salivate just by hearing a bell. So 
when the unconditional response like meet is removed, the bell becomes this conditioned stimulus. It creates a conditioned response in the person. Extinction can also happen. So for the unconditional stimulus, if it's constantly removed, we're no longer going to salivate. It's only exposed to the neutral stimulus. One of the things that initial psychological treatments of offenders try to do is use aversive conditioning by exposing someone to something that they enjoy and pairing it with an unpleasant stimulus. So one of the ways that they tried this was with individuals that committed sexual offenses. What happened would be they would expose the offender to a description of a sexual assault against the child or a sexual assault against someone else and then they would pair it with a electroshock. That way they would begin to associate their behavior with this negative response. Ultimately though this had no real impact on reductions in offending and some were actually concerned that this could increase the likelihood of offending because what would happen is the individual would begin to associate sort of sexual pleasure and, play and pain and that this would lead to further involvement in sexual offenses. A good example of classical conditioning in action is a more recent example as in our office episode. So we'll take a look at this and then in the comments section on Canvas, I want you to tell me what you think you saw in this video in terms of what was the neutral stimulus, what was the unconditioned stimulus, and what was the conditioned response. file. I have to reboot again. Hey Dwight, do you want an Altoid? What do you think? In school, we learned about this scientist who trained dogs to salivate at the sound of a bell by feeding them whenever a bell rang. So for the past couple weeks, I've been conducting a similar experiment. Dwight, one Altoid. Okay. Altoid? Sure. Vintoid? Vintoid? Yes. What are you doing? That was classical conditioning. Talk a little bit about operant conditioning next week, I believe, which was more about B.F. Skinner. Classical conditioning principles focus a lot on Watson, a lot on Pavlov. We'll look at operant conditioning to focus on the reinforcement and punishment side of learning that Skinner was really well known for with his Skinner box. Around the same time was Alfred Bandura, and he developed a theory of social learning. Very importantly, focus on this. Social learning, according to Bandura, is not the same thing as social learning theory that we see espoused by criminologists like C. Ray Jeffries, maybe more a sociologist, and Ronald Akers, who is a sociologist but looked at a lot of criminological theories and was maybe most well known for social learning theory. Social learning theory and social learning are not the same thing. Alfred Bandura talked about social learning just as a way of understanding that humans take a more active approach to learning. What we learn can be mediated by certain factors. So there's that term that you heard at the beginning of the class, mediate. What does it mean here? The idea is that maybe if we do begin to learn something, we will only put it into practice if who we learn from matter. This is the idea that if we see somebody who we respect engage in a particular behavior, we maybe are more likely to learn from them and repeat that behavior than if we're watching someone that we do not respect. The focus here was on the element of observational learning. Until this point, learning was very much based on something happens to you and you learn from that. This idea was like, no, we need to look further. We need to look more at our social environment. What the person sees can also influence how they're going to behave. A little after 
Bender's notion of social learning, he came up with this idea of moral disengagement, which is very important for understanding youth because almost all youth can be like morally disengaged to some extent because they want to fight back against authority. Just think about like that 15, 16 year old stage of your life where you don't want to be around your parents, you don't want to be around your teachers. I don't want to speak for other people, maybe that's sort of like how I might have felt is you want to have some sense of autonomy. So that's kind of a natural aspect of adolescence. But moral disengagement take things a little bit further where the individual will engage in problematic behavior but then displace their responsibility for such behavior. They'll say that, oh, who cares about engaging in antisocial behavior? Or the victim deserved it. They did something to precipitate it. I needed that money, so it's fine that I stole it. So they come up with justifications for their behavior and sometimes in ways that dehumanize their victim. This can look like, but is not the same as features of psychopathy. Moral disengagement symptoms tend to be more fleeting. It's something that people will age out of over time, whereas features of psychopathy include moral disengagement elements, but also some like callous unemotional traits, manipulative traits, pathological lying. We'll have a lecture specific to this later on in the semester. I think it will be week five where I'll reuse some more material. Sorry about this, but I think that it's relevant to the class, so I'm going to share it. I'll just zoom in on this slide here about Kohlberg's moral development stages. And what I love about these developmental stages theories are that they really set the tone for developmental criminology, which is what I've been heavily influenced by in my own research. The idea that there might be pathways to involvement in criminal behavior. For the exam, you're not going to need to memorize all of these different stages and what they entail. I just want you to have a general understanding of the developmental stages. So Colbert begins with this idea of we can within individuals see that there are, there's the identification of bad acts and that there are behaviors that are wrong. So understanding that like think about like three-year-old begins to understand what is good and what is bad, the naughty or nice phase they begin to internalize social rules. At stage two, this is where we begin to see individuals show empathy for others. They understand that there is a right and a wrong thing to do, and now they understand how right and wrong can benefit or hurt other people. The sense of fairness develops at this stage. At stage three, it's where the individual begins to care about other people and how they view them. They want to be seen by others as good. The opinion of others matters. Stage four is where individuals want other people to also follow the rules. We understand that there are certain social niceties or social expectations and it's no longer just the fact that we want to follow them, it's that we want others to follow them as well. Stages five and six are when we get to see more nuanced understanding of social order. Understanding of things like, well, different families have different rules, that there is some gray area in these rules, and some people follow certain rules, but disagree about others. By the end of the sixth stage, individuals kind of have their own moral philosophy about how they want to behave in this world. talked about biological theories, we've talked about psychological theories, now to focus on the sociological theories. We'll talk a little bit about Merton, Sean McKay, Sutherland, and Sykes and Matza. Merton was most commonly associated with these ideas of anime and strain, anime which actually emerged prior to Merton with Emile Durkheim and he focused on suicidal behavior. Merton began to extend these ideas of anime and strain to criminal behavior a more contemporary strain theory perspective is Agnew's general strain theory. Merton focused on modes of adaptation. Each of the theories you see here is what I would refer to as the adolescence limited criminology paradigm. These four theoretical perspectives were almost entirely based on trying to explain adolescent delinquent behavior, not necessarily criminal behavior, through a sociological lens. And Edwin Sutherland, who I think actually almost ruined criminology, 
is the leader of the ALC paradigm. And Sutherland said that criminologists should only be trained in sociology, that we should never consider biological perspectives, that we should never consider psychological perspectives. Sean McKay's theory is a bit different from these other three because they are basing their theory on a macro level explanation of criminal behavior. Macro level crime rates might be focusing on things like why is neighborhood violence higher in one neighborhood compared to another neighborhood. They're not trying to explain criminal behavior at the individual level. Sutherland, here's what I find so ironic about him. He said that we should never listen to psychologists, yet his differential association theory was all about learning. Where did we learn learning from? Psychologists. So Sutherland, there's a, like the most prestigious award that you can receive in criminology is named after Sutherland but he was really, he would probably hate the state of criminology today because it's much more integrated and I think that's how it should be. But he really wanted only sociologists to study criminology. And that's why we see a real distaste for the positivist school of thought within sociological textbooks because there was much more of this emphasis on just coming up with theories of crime but not actually testing them. We'll end with Sykes and Matz's discussion of techniques of neutralization, basically just ways of justifying improper behavior, which also kind of sounds like moral disengagement. Merton's theory is quite interesting. Basically described five different types of persons. The innovator, the individual who engages in ritualism, the person that engages in retreatism, the person that engages in rebellion, and the person that conforms. So according to Merton, individuals that were innovators and individuals that engaged in rebellion might be the individuals most likely to engage in criminal behavior. So let's go through each of the five here. So the person that's the innovator does not accept the institutional means, but accepts the cultural goals. So I probably should define what it means to have institutional means and cultural goals. Institutional or institutionalized means basically are a set of rules within society about how we work, about how we go about achieving specific goals. So it's the mechanisms by which we accomplish our goals. And usually in society, it's about getting a job, working hard, treating others well. And cultural goals are what do we want to accomplish through these means? Do we want the house with the white picket fence, the Lamborghini, the jewelry, the cell phone, and so on? The traditional goals that we might see within a capitalist structure associated with North America. The innovators want those goals. They want the cars, the jewelry, the house, and so on, but they don't want to follow the rules to get there. So such individuals might be gang involved or they might be involved in drug trafficking, financial based crimes. The ritualism trajectory or pathway is kind of a sadder one of us where an individual accepts the means. They want to work hard. They want to get the job, but maybe because of social class and the difficulty moving up in society or the difficulty that stems from having neuropsychological deficits or a negative family environment means that they're never able to actually accomplish the cultural goals that are associated with these means. The individual associated with the retreatism mode of adaptation is an individual that rejects the means, rejects the goals, and does their, their own thing. And very often this is associated with drug use. If you've ever seen the movie Train Spotting, watch the first one. I haven't watched the second one because I heard it wasn't very good. But the first one is a good example of individuals that reject the means, reject the goals of traditional society, and instead engage in drug use. The individuals that are associated with the rebellion mode of adaptation are trying to replace the institutional means or replace the cultural goals. They might be thought of as anarchists. They want to fundamentally change what the means, the institutional means are thought of as and what the cultural goals are within a particular society. Then finally, the last one here, the individual who conforms is the individual that accepts the means and achieves the cultural goals associated with those. Social disorganization theory tends to focus on that macro level explanation of criminal behavior. The top image there, you can see Jane and Finch that I talked about last week. It's a neighborhood in Toronto. Bottom here, you can see the downtown east side. 
And there are three key points about social disorganization theory. First, there's what they would refer to, and we have to be careful here because the term makes it almost sound like individuals might be racist or that individuals might be xenophobic. Because the first principle of social disorganization theory is that crime will be higher in neighborhoods that are more ethnically heterogeneous. So what that means is that in neighborhoods with a greater variety of individuals from different ethnic backgrounds, there will be more crime. Now, the reason why this might be the case is not because certain ethnicities are more crime prone than others. It's more about the failure for different cultures to merge together and for there to be agreed upon norms and agreed upon goals, just like we talked about with the modes of adaptation. So remember when we were talking last week about different gangs. So South Side of Chicago is a great example of how you can have Italian gangs, Polish gangs, and these different cultures have different values. We talked about Catholic versus Protestant values. These things can cause a clash. So that's what they meant by ethnic heterogeneity. Residential mobility is the other one that's associated with higher neighborhood level crime rates. What this means is that there's a high degree of rentals in the neighborhood as opposed to owned houses or owned condos. And so we see a lot of turnover. Your neighbor one week might be different from the neighbor the next week. And when you have this high degree of turnover, people aren't necessarily looking out for one another. So that sort of sense of community doesn't really get to be established. Related to both of these earlier two principles is the third principle, which is the idea of collective efficacy. Collective efficacy describes communities that are able to mobilize to fight against things like crime. But it doesn't have to be crime. It could be poverty. It could be to improve the state of schools. It could be really anything that is associated with living in a community. But in terms of crime, collective efficacy, higher levels of collective efficacy would mean that this neighborhood is able to develop a block watch program or gather together to raise funds to help somebody that was a victim of a crime. Finding ways to help improve the state of the community, the sense of belongingness that is going to reduce involvement in criminal behavior. So in neighborhoods with high levels of social disorganization, the controls that otherwise would be present to prevent delinquency just are not there. In fact, individuals who are living in these neighborhoods might actually approve of certain delinquent behavior, might prefer to live in that innovator mode of adaptation where the goals are to get rich, but the means are less pro-social. I alluded to the concentric zone theory last week, but just to go over it again, Sean McKay found that the rate of juvenile offending remained constant over time within the zone in transition, despite heavy turnover in population, AKA a high level of residential mobility. So even though different people are moving in and out, crime rates within the zoning transition remain the same, but out on the suburbs in that residential zone or that commuter zone, we saw the level of juvenile offending drop over time. So remember that zone in transition is what we would think of when we're talking about social disorganization. We can look within different neighborhoods and identify which ones are more likely to be socially disorganized and the zone in transition is one of those more socially disorganized neighborhoods. That was a more macro level explanation of crime. Sutherland's principles of differential association we talked about nine, but I'll focus on four of the main ones. The first being that criminal behavior is learned. He then said that the way that individuals learn crime is in groups through communication, both verbal and nonverbal. When we were talking about mediating mechanisms associated with learning that Bandura initially put forward, Sutherland also acknowledged this point and said that intimate groups may be more important for learning. So we're more likely to learn from the individuals who we are most commonly socializing with, who we care most about. So Sutherland said that a person becomes delinquent because of an excess of definitions favorable to violating the law. So when there are more definitions that say, yeah, you should engage in crime, then the individual is more likely to actually engage in crime. There are a lot of problems with Sutherland's differential association theory. One of them was testability. So for example, how do we 
measure excess of definitions favorable to the violation of the law? What would we actually do to measure that? Will we ask an individual, how many people do you know that have told you that it's okay to offend? But what happens when Sutherland also acknowledged that intimate groups are more important than non-intimate groups? So what if 16 people in your non-intimate group said don't do crime, but one person in your intimate group said do do crime? So now you have definitions of crime that are not excessively in favor of violating the law, 16 versus one, but is that one person more important because they're part of your intimate group? So there's some major problems with the differential association theory, which is why criminologists looked at operant conditioning and then looked at social learning theory, which we'll talk about next week. I'll zoom in here on Sykes and Matz's techniques of neutralization, which essentially describe different ways that individuals would go about denying or putting away their responsibility for behavior that was criminal. So they talked about denial of responsibility when the offender denies it was even their fault. So might blame another factor like, oh, I was drunk or oh, I was high. The condemnation of condemners technique of neutralization says that the offender will say that, oh, the justice system is out to get me. Police are out to get me. And I'm being picked on for something that others have done in the past and not been punished before. The appeal to higher loyalties is where an individual claims that the rule of law had to be ignored because they were standing up for somebody. They were getting revenge for a family member. Somebody had assault, insulted their family, their religion, or their race. And so they are taking a stand against these issues when we see a lot of racially motivated offenses especially down in the united states it's often based on its appeal to higher loyalty the denial of injury is where the individual will claim that the individual that they offended against the victim was not really hurt or they had insurance the stores got tons of tvs they're not going to miss one so it's saying like crime they committed didn't really hurt anybody the denial of the victim is where the offender claims that the victim was in the wrong. Like they did something to precipitate the crime. It's their fault for the way that they had behaved, especially when we're looking at offenses like sexual assault. The individual might argue that, oh, like she led me on. I'll talk now about two individuals from early stages of positive school of criminological behavior that don't really fit into a theoretical perspective, but were hugely important to the development of future theoretical perspectives in contemporary criminology. I'm talking about Sheldon and Eleanor Gluck. There's a really interesting paper written by John Lobb and Robert Sampson in 1991. I'll post it to Canvas. They talked about the influence of the Glucks and how Sutherland hated the Glucks because of their focus on multi-factor research. They tried to look at family level factors, neighborhood level factors, school factors, internal factors to the individual that might explain why they would be involved in criminal behavior. So this idea of looking at sociological theories, psychological theories, biological theories really rubs Sutherland the wrong way. And so he actually attacked the Glucks and Sutherland was responsible for writing the first ever criminological textbook. And he basically used it to shoot down all of the ideas that the Glucks held. And the Glucks were accused of being atheoretical. And this was really true. It, they didn't have a theory of crime. They just were focused on research design and methodology. So they conducted really rigorous longitudinal research. They collected a sample of 500 individuals involved in crime and 500 individuals not involved in crime and followed up with this test group and control group to see what happened to them in adulthood. So looking at from youth offending to adult offending, who continues offending, who does not continue offending, and why does this actually happen? So this was so important for contemporary research that is almost all longitudinal now. So Sheldon and Eleanor Gluck were really important for setting some of the foundations for modern day criminology, but it didn't help that one of their, one of Sheldon's brothers was a eugenicist and the Glucks kind of became guilty by association. Even though they themselves were not eugenicists, they were linked in with this positive school of criminology, ideological based perspectives. And Sutherland basically spent his career trashing the Glucks. And that's what led to that 
ALC, that adolescence limited criminology paradigm that I referred to earlier. Sheldon and Eleanor Gluck were responsible for helping initiate developmental life course criminology, which is what I'll focus on a lot in this class because it's what my research interests are based on, which is the idea that we need to study individuals over the full life course, essentially from birth through to adulthood. So that's why in this class, even though it's a class on youth offending, I don't want to focus just on people that are between the ages of 12 and 17, because if we look only at youth offenders between these two ages, then we're going to miss out on really important questions about what led to them becoming involved in crime. To understand that, we need to look at childhood. We also want to know which youth continue to offend in adulthood. To do that, we actually need to conduct research on these youth over time into different stages of adulthood. So these are some of the research questions that I'll try to address in next week's class. That's it for this week's class. Hope everyone has a good week and we'll see you in the group discussion section on Canvas. Mm -hmm.